So, so Amy Graves comes to us from Swarthmore College, where she is the Walter Kemp Professor in the Natural Sciences. She did her doctoral work um, at MIT and postdoctoral work at Exxon and Columbia. Um, Amy is a fellow of the American Physical Society and past chair of the APS Division of Computational Physics. Uh, she's a computational physicist who works on soft matter. Uh, she also has publications on the subject of gender and science. Uh, Amy is a Cleveland native, and she has visited us in the past, but not in a long time, so this was quite due. Uh, finally, I think we can also formally award her the prize for the best seminar title this semester. Um, so we're delighted to have you here, Amy. Uh, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Am I audible? Is everything yes. okay? All right, terrific. And I can even see my laser pointer. So I'll start my clock. Um, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you for letting me talk to you about the work that we've been doing about the jamming of active and inert matter. Um, so what, while I would really like to move this Zoom environment so it's not at the top of my slide, but you can see it, so that's all that's important. Um, since this is a general interest talk, it behooves me to start out by saying to zero of order, what does it mean when a system is jammed? Jammed traditionally refers to a situation in which there is a collection of entities, polymers, food grains, bubbles, which are in a disordered solid state. That is, it can sustain a non-zero shear stress, but not be in a regular crystal like salt or a PMMA colloid, but rather be like the foam in a shaving cream where you can poke it and it will retain its shape if you poke it gently. Uh, you don't have to poke it gently. Um, you can poke it aggressively and induce plastic deformation. And if you're artistic enough, you can create these beautiful sand paintings as were done by artist Andres Amador. So sand is a really good example to use for your non-scientist friends to talk about the jamming of materials. Dry sand flows, if you kick sand in the air, especially in zero G, it's a granular gas. Um, you can sift sand and it, you can stir it and it's a granular fluid, but when you stand on it, you don't drop to your doom through the layers of sand, rather you compress it into a solid. And so it can be elastic. And if one um, aggressively shears it, what it can undergo plastic deformation as well. So I hope to also talk to you a bit about active matter. When we talk about the jamming of active matter, we are more concerned with the state in which there is an arrested motion of individuals like these mice, like this model that Mandala and I'll discuss in, um, in nature, um, where you have these active particles with their own power source that have a certain relaxation time to change their direction of motion and also have a propulsion force. And you see a very rich phase diagram, the bottom of which consists of a region of dynamical arrest. And right here would be proper jamming and lots of cool stuff, liquid to arrest and an intermittent phase where there are bursts of kinetic energy. Um, an example and a rather sobering one is crowd dynamics. Um, Weidmann's fundamental diagram um, the fundamental diagram tends to talk about the typical velocity of the aggregate as a function, say, of the density of entities. And if you get a sufficient number of people trying to get somewhere, you truly have a jamming point because to get somewhere with a crowd involves concerted motion. And there, um, through history, there have been um, terrible disasters because the physics of crowds worked against the well-being of the people in the crowd and there were crush disasters and asphyxiation disasters, the most recent of which very sadly as the world has been opening up from COVID, people are not maybe keeping in mind the rules about safe venues that they did have before. And this was in Houston two weeks ago at a rock concert, rap concert. Um, so this talk, what about this talk? Um, there is a jamming phase diagram that folks like to draw with various axes. And as you reduce the load, as you reduce the temperature, as you increase the density, you move into the jammed phase. This point called point J is going to be a focus of my talk. There's an analogous kind of phase diagram for clogging, where you might have a compatible load for clog clogging, might be compatible, maybe heavy gravity when you're, when you're trying to get through some kind of egress. There are incompatible loads for clogging, um, possibly the presence of noise in the system. There are also geometrical effects. How wide are your doorways? How large are your active particles? So, Onto these kinds of phase diagrams, 
I hope to convince you that it's interesting to think about an additional degree of freedom, the inclusion of um, fixed pins. It quenched disorder if they're in a disordered state, they might be actually placed um, in a periodic array. So what do pins do to change the, um, the, uh, change the boundary between jammed and unjammed in systems like this and clogged and unclogged? So, so the bit diagram of the right distractive systems, and is that the distinction? Um, well, the, uh, folks like to draw a similar phase diagram for, but absolutely, jamming of active systems will look quite similar. You can certainly shear active active matter as well. You can certainly talk about either a temperature or an effective temperature for active matter. You can um, puff air. You can do various things to, to simulate a thermal thermal field. Yeah. But what's Sorry. the difference between clogging and jamming? Yeah. Oh, sometimes people uh, you treat them as synonymous. Um, if you pour salt from a salt shaker, the first thing that happens when the salt stops flowing, and salt shakers are, are premeditatedly designed to clog because you don't want all of the stuff pouring on your dinner. So first there'll be a clog, and then when you look above the clog, there is a jammed system of salt. Yes. So fixed degrees of freedom have been studied in many contexts including jamming. Brito et al. in 2012 had a lovely paper where they had increased the fixed density of, of particles in their simulation. Um, and this was about glass forming systems, but they also delineated a jamming transition and showed that the more and more pinned particles you have, the lower and lower was the volume fraction that you needed to jam. They showed a number of other lovely results, but this hasn't been heavily studied. And so we've been very lucky to be funded by the NSF to look into modifying jam structures by inserting fixed degrees of freedom. Here is our wonderful team from Bucknell, Professor Volmeyer Lee at Swarthmore, my experimental colleague, Casey Bester. Brian Utter has now moved to a California university and we depend on Sean Riddout who just defended his PhD thesis a couple of days ago at UPenn. So all together, we've been working on a variety of systems Far too many to bring to one talk, but I'm, so I'm going to focus on two of them. Um, but I just want to show you the richness of what we are trying to do. So Volmeyer Lee has been our lead investigator doing an, um, a lamp simulation. Lamps is an environment um, created at Sandia Labs. It's used worldwide to do molecular dynamics for granular materials and more. We have experiments going on. There's student Andy Zhang peering through a piece of plastic um, into which they've drilled holes ready for pins. Here are our pins in our C++ simulation ready to receive soft particles. Here's, um, our, here are our pins in a Java simulation that I hope to talk about near the end of active matter, trying to access, competitively access a single average. So just a little bit more. So here's our molecular dynamic simulation, equal ready to run. Here are Professor Vester's photoelastic grains with some pins set in. Here are my soft particles. Here's our active matter. Um, on which we hope to do about molecular dynamics with something called the HBM social force model. And down the line, Katerina has sheared the top and bottom layers in opposite directions to a simple shear of the system. And we are following the velocity field and trying to understand the response to the simple shear. Professor Bester has done a uniaxial compression of these photoelastic grains and between cross polarizers, one sees these lovely strong force chains, at least one of which very clearly is terminating on one of the four pins that she's got in the system at present. Um, here is our force network about which I hope to say more in this talk. And here is our bidirectional flow molecular dynamic simulation in mid simulation with particles that want to go south, the cyan particles going south, those that want to go north, magenta going north, and in competition for a single narrow doorway, which is our situation of interest about which I hope to talk today. Um, I think something in the chat, Gary, could you check? Chuck said something. Yeah, if anyone's got an other question, wants me to stop. Okay, we can keep going. Yeah, please. If there's a, a clarification question, I'd love to stop. A longer question, you judge, maybe we wait on it. Um, so my, my first of two topics has to do with our work on jamming around fixed particles. Here are the wonderful students who've been working with us over the last five years. Um, Andy and Arushi are the most recent students. 
Um, and these are all undergraduate students. We have no grad students at Swarthmore. What is our model? We do the, if you will, if you're all physicists, I can say this is the Ising model of jamming. For more other folks, we would say it's our spherical cow, um, a 50 50 mix of bi dispersed disks large and small with this radius ratio. Now, for such a system, the so-called maximally random jammed packing volume fraction would be 84% in two dimensions, 64% in three dimensions, rather smaller than the close packing density in two and three dimensions that you would expect for such particles. Our model is one, our Ising model is one of soft spheres. They don't see each other if they sit outside of each other's mutual diameter, but when they overlap, they overlap with a power law repulsion in the distance between them. Our choice has been to take alpha equals two. So these are like harmonic, soft harmonic repulsions. And we have two snapshots of the system. If it is at a volume fraction less than criticality, they're not touching, no energy, no pressure. Z is an important quantity. It's a typical number of contacts per particle. Z is zero, no bulk or shear modulus. However, when we surpass the jamming threshold, we get a pressure and that pressure happens to scale linearly with a distance from criticality. Um, there is a critical value of the number of contacts ZC that I'll talk more about. The distance from criticality goes as the square root of pressure. The bulk modulus happens to scale as P to the zero. So the bulk modulus jumps up to a finite value. It does not scale at all with pressure. Whereas the shear modulus, in contrast to what you would expect from an ordered solid, scales differently than the bulk modulus. It goes to zero continuously as pressure goes to zero. So there's lots of stories told about that model. Why do we even use this model? Well, first of all, the jamming line is very well defined with a clear transition from zero to finite pressure when you cross the threshold. Secondly, there are very interesting properties which emerge as a consequence of the correspondence between the jamming point and a marginal stability condition. Um, and finally, last but not least, physical observables exhibit non-trivial power law scalings like these as a function of the distance from the jamming threshold. So it made sense as we did this foray into asking the question, what do pins do to the system to pick this very beautifully delineated system with such clear signatures um, of jamming? And what do we do for protocol? We place our particles in pins, we minimize the energy. There will always be a few particles which are not needed for the mechanical stability of the system. Folks call them rattlers. We get rid of them, we don't include them in further analysis. And then we test our final configurations for mechanical stability, for the lowest po positive lowest vibrational mode eigenvalue. That is, we don't want any collective motions that cost zero energy. Um, so this would be called collective jamming. And something new, when you place pins in the system, you might create finite clusters. And so this is lovely. It wouldn't be the case if there were no pins there. Either you'd have no particles left or you'd have a rigid spanning cluster left. So we exclude these very interesting objects from further analysis and say we only care about a bulk jam system. And then we look at our final configurations. They might have various pressures. We can extrapolate to the jamming point, P equals zero. Alternatively, um, in the last few months, we've been implementing a pressure sweep protocol, which lets us target a particular pressure and then move that target and hopefully understand some of the scaling properties. But a lot of that will be work in progress. And you see, it's not very mature in, in the data I show. Let me show you some data that is mature. We were actually able to publish a paper about a square lattice of pins and what happens is you increase the density of pins. So in this paper, one take home message is that long range spatial order develops. If one, for example, looks at the pair correlation function, unlike the pair correlation function of a dense liquid, these little knobby knobs are here um, indicating G of R for a system which has about half as many pins as it does particles. And you can see that there is indeed long range correlation between the positions of particles. Um, and this is due to the existence of the lattice. So um, yes. these two plots look very similar, the liquid argon and the one that you have. Mm -hmm. um, 
but the models are quite different and right? there are no pins in the liquid diagram so right um and indeed uh, sorry about the color choice there's actually a no pin curve hiding behind the pin curve oh, okay. and it looks entirely like liquid argon i wanted to grab the plot that came from prairie's own thesis mm -hmm. and unfortunately it was in black and white excellent yeah. observation mm -hmm. yeah so these jam solids they're solids but they have a g of r that looks a heck of a lot like a liquid you know a dense liquid well, until I, you put pins in yes and the spacing in that right figure that corresponds to the size of the Particles, not the pins, basically um, the pins. Right. So it's it's brokering a compromise between packing the particles and living between pins, which have a size which is about 0 0.08 in units where a box is of size one. That's right. It's not perfectly commensurate with the pin spacing. And in fact, we looked at the scattering function S of K and we looked in various lattice directions and we saw cool spikes that showed ordering in the different, you know. Um, based on the the, uh, the direction of the um, inverse lattice vector, and we actually identified them with having two particles per principal unit cell. So pretty cool. Yeah. Um, also, how many pins do you have here? Um, this is 144. So these are very small simulations. Thank goodness for um, for lamps and the National Science Foundation supercomputer. We're moving to a situation where we'll be simulating 10,000 particles. But the data that you're going to see today, you're going to see about truth of 200 to 500 particles. Yes. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, I have a question about Thank the you. pressure. Thank you for following and asking. All right. So on to things that are not published. Um, we wanted to vary the geometry of the lattice. I thought, wouldn't it be cool if there was a lattice that was optimally supportive of jamming? You could get away with putting in much less matter and get a much more stable configuration. So we played with a couple of different Brave lattices and realized quickly that just what we needed, pins add an additional length scale. There's the lattice constant in addition to the size of the particles. So how am I going to tell you a story of what the lattice does? And this is the story of granular materials. One always struggles with telling you about the length scale. Should I tell you about the radius of small particles to the lattice constant? Should I frame um, our results in terms of rather the area per particle divided by the area per pin? And this is going to be different because the triangular lattice is more closely packed. So same A is going to be a denser lattice for the triangles than the square lattice. And the honeycomb lattice will be the least dense. And I have our geometrical factors here below calculated thanks to our brilliant undergraduate students. Or should I just tell you about the ratio of pins to particles? And certainly these three are not independent of each other on the back of the envelope. You can delineate the relationships between them. But it still begs the question when we measure something like the jamming threshold, how should I tell you the jamming threshold decreases with pins? And it's kind of a dumb moment. Of course, it decreases when you put in pins. The pins have no size. You're putting in these points of support into a system that needs to be supported. So we see this generic behavior, and we are cheered by the fact that it does not matter what lattice you pick at very low lattice densities. And now I'm showing you um, this, which is the area per, of a particle divided by the area per pin and showing you that this is linear. And there's a good reason that this is linear. The slope is also around minus 0.1. And I'll try to argue to you with sort of a mean fieldish argument why that's not a bad value for nature to have chosen. So why would it decrease linearly with pin density? Well, in the beautiful soft sphere model, it has been well understood for the last eight years that there is a critical length scale, so-called cutting length, which divides the hyperstatic from isostatic regimes, kind of like a correlation length in condensed matter physics. Um, and that length scale scales as the distance from criticality to minus a critical exponent, which is known to be a half. So when you put in pins, you replace that length scale with the separation between pins. And if you work out that math, now the distance from criticality should go like the lattice constant to the minus one over nu, nu is a half, should go like the lattice constant to the minus two, and that is how alpha scales. So that makes us very happy that there's linearity in the, um, in the distance from criticality induced by these pins. And this argument has no reason to work as well as it does, but why should the slope be minus 0.11? If I make a mean fieldish kind of counting argument and say, every time I pluck out a particle, that particle used to support 
Z critical other particles, and Z critical is four in two dimensions. Put in one pin, it supports one particle. So pins replace particles at a ratio of one to four. Oh, except actually what it turns out is that for very low densities, many of the pins are ignored. About half of them are completely superfluous and you can shake them out of the system like rattlers. So you put those numbers together and you get a slope which is minus 0.14 very close to minus 0.11, as I said, has no right to be as good as it is. It's completely mean fieldish argument. Um, all right, so there is this wonderful thing, the marginal stability condition. Um, in very simple jammed systems, the critical point is a point of isostaticity. And James Clerk Maxwell was the first person to really talk about this stuff in mechanics and say that, you know, Suppose the number of degrees of freedom is exactly equal to the number of physical constraints in a system. That would be an isostatic system. So this little uh, built thing built of boards is not isostatic, but put in one more, one more bond and you get an isostatic system. We do this counting how many bonds are there. Excess bonds are the number of bonds minus the isostatic number. What is the isostatic number? Okay, well, they're n particles in d dimensions. Oh, but the center of mass has to be allowed in it. So we take away D, we add one bond to have a positive bulk modulus, and that should be our isostatic number. And the Maxwell counting criterion says, gee, if it's isostatic, the number of excess bonds is zero. Also, since every bond has one particle at either end, the number of contacts is actually specified for an isostatic system. It is twice the dimensionality. So at jamming in two dimensions, the number of contacts jumps below the threshold from zero up to four. And that's what we would expect in two dimensions. However, in very simple jam systems, phi C is a point of isostaticity, but it is very easy to find systems that are not isostatic. Suppose you add friction to your model or you're doing an experiment on frictional particles. It turns out that isostaticity would be that there are D plus one, not two D contacts. However, if you dial the friction from very strong to very weak, your model systems will, will obediently toggle between the isostatic limit for friction and the isostatic limit for no friction. And in between, what have you got? You've got an um, over-coordinated frictive system. It is hyperstatic. Or if you do jamming of spheroids or ellipsoids, they have more, they have rotational degrees of freedom that need to be pinned down for isostaticity. And yeah, if your aspect ratio is one, everything is perfect. But until you get very long, very large aspect ratio ellipsoids, actually not isostatic, right? There are floppy modes, but it's still a jam system. So, and don't even get me started about biological applications where we talk about jamming of cells and it, the, 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 um, the paradigm is a wonderful paradigm, but it, it, their isostaticity has nothing to do with when a layer of migrating cells decides that it's gonna freeze up and form a, you know, an immobile sheet. So we were delightfully surprised to see that our systems with pins, in fact, still fell in the class of being isostatic systems. That is, as you go towards zero pressure, the number of excess bonds goes towards zero. The square lattice, the triangular lattice, pretty cool. Another cool thing, though, was that you do have these pins that only require the particle touches the pin. There's no other particle on the other end. So we have broken this perfect proportionality between the typical number of contacts and the number of bonds. We have some freedom there. So it is actually not the case that Z critical is twice the dimensionality. But as we add pins, the number of contacts drops and drops and drops systematically. And that feels rather technologically important to me. Jamming with pins is frugal. It requires fewer contacts per particle. Also with the jamming threshold dropping, it requires less material to jam. So, and, the, and actually the Rattler fraction rises. So you get a mechanically stable solid with less stuff and fewer contacts but are the contacts stronger or weaker? And that's, that's a story that I'd like to tell you as well before we, we have to part. So um, what about scaling behaviors? So we look, for example, at the order parameter, which is Z minus C critical. It's well accepted that it goes as the distance from criticality to a power beta where beta is around a half. This is true for 
very idealized and very dirty non-idealized systems, including foams, um, as Catherine and Ben Heck showed in 2010. So we expect beta to be a half. And in fact, we see, so what would beta be? It would be that the fit to this Z versus the pressure. And here, these different curves are different densities of pin lattice. So you see Z critical dropping and dropping, but how about that fit? Um, of Z minus Z critical to pressure. Well, for low pin density, it feels like that critical exponent is well and good. And sorry, the data really look kind of schleppy. It's, it's, I think it's just finite size effects that I'm showing you data from 230 particles, not 2000 particles. Um, so beta hovers a little bit above that value of a half with big error bars, but clearly beta is showing dependence on the lattice as we get to denser lattices. So this starts to be the refrain of a song that I'm singing repeatedly, which is that for very low pin densities, we've not broken things about jamming. We have even high pin densities, it's still isostatic of jamming, but we've not broken critical behavior. We've not broken the critical exponents, but we are starting to change them for the denser pin lattices. Um, Speaking of practical things, are we making a, a system which is more or less rigid by adding pins very quickly? I would think, well, it's more rigid. You're adding these points of support. Yes, but you're adding them before you equilibrate the system and you're creating a different kind of jam structure. And it turns out that if you look at the bulk modulus, it is decreasing with the fraction of pins. So why in the world is that? It's tough to model it theoretically, um, but I have to say it's certainly consistent with experiment and simulation on granular packs because as polydispersity increases, you're increasing the porosity. And when you increase the porosity of the material, you're making it more pliable, less elastic. And so we kind of believe that's what we're seeing. Um, ongoing work is about the scaling exponents that have to do with elasticity. Um, we, if we take the affine part of the bulk and shear moduli, they are very boringly constant as we change the pressure. And that is exactly what one expects the elastic moduli to do with pressure. We expect the affine parts to be constant. We expect the bulk modulus, even when we add non-affine responses to stay constant. And it does for low pin densities, but then we start to pick up a new exponent that's non-zero as the pin density gets higher. And always this pin fraction, I, I, I'll mention it in a bit. What, so what, what's the line of demarcation? What does it mean to have dense pins? Okay, it is about local structure. There's not some lovely, exotic, sexy, long length scale where once the pins are closer than some long length scale, they start to have an effect. Fortunately or unfortunately, it's really about local packing. It's when the separation between pins is commensurate with the size of the particles that all of these things start to happen. We start to get a richer, more interesting system than one that is jammed without pins. And so here- you mean by a non-affine response? You said something about a non-affine response. Can right, you explain right. That? Oh, just that this is the bulk modulus, but you can actually dice out the part of the elastic moduli the part of the rearrangements that you would be projected onto the kind of deformation you do. So you squeeze the system, the particles deform, you can project their deformations back along the lines of squeezing or the, or the lines of shearing. And that the change in energy that occurs, if you project those deformations back, you would call the affine response. But if you let it be what nature wants it to be, which there is also rearrangement, not along the lines that the shear field would indicate, that would be the real, true, non-affine response. Did, did that answer the question? And there's different colors of the different lattices? Or... Um, yes, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, I work with brilliant people, but they're undergraduates, so they haven't had years of experience in science. And they don't think about the fact that um, that um, the, 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 uh, yeah. the data points should be bigger and old, boring people like me would go, yeah, make those bigger, but sorry. But yeah. screens have gotten smaller too, yeah. so I think <laughs> yes. on our old curtain screen, it will be fine. There we are. Yes, I do apologize. Some of these are, you know, ongoing work, not quite ready for prime time, but so happy to share with you all and have you all give me feedback. Okay. So what have I done here? I've actually, you know, we're still plotting as a function of alpha, but it's where lambda, the, 
the linear size scale starts to be important. That is, if you ask yourself, at what density are these particles unable to shoehorn themselves between two pins? Okay, well, at this density, at the density indicated, say, by the green line, even two small particles beyond here would not be able to shoehorn themselves between two pins in the triangular lattice. And you can see that a plateau emerges. Similarly for the square lattice plateau, eh, we can stretch our mind a little bit for the honeycomb lattice too, perhaps, and see that it is really about packing when we, and in fact, this deviation from this linear behavior happens when it's two large particles that cannot shoehorn themselves between pins. So once more, it seems to be the local structure that dictates when interesting things happen to the jamming threshold and even something that has not been seen before, which is a jamming threshold that doesn't drop as you increase the density of quench disorder, but actually starts to rise again. Um, right, so um, excluded volume effects. These particles are having trouble packing maximizing their entropy given their constraints, um, given the extra constraint of having pins here. Okay, so what I would love to show you now with the last five minutes of this part of the talk is that the bond network becomes increasingly anisotropic and one can focus in on one unit cell. Um, my students are very creative and the one who created this image decided he didn't want the pin at the center of view. So you will see it here at, at, in a corner of the view. And what are we looking at here? You are looking at where one particle touches the other particle. And you're looking at the likely positions where there is a contact between two particles and seeing these interesting figure eight shapes. Where do they come from? So here is a here is a movie of where they come from. Two particles not really rolling against each other, but in different configurations, two particles in different locations sandwiched between two pins trying to fit themselves in creates this locus of contact positions which have the shape of a figure eight. So we are seeing these in our system and we're seeing these as pin density increases become increasingly more prevalent. Here's our triangular lattice. Here's our square lattice here. I actually drew in the particles to give people more of a sense of what I'm talking about, which is we're, we're tracing out the likely positions of contact between the two particles. Um, okay. So pretty pictures, there is more than just the story told by two particles. As you can see from this symmetry, there's obviously stories told by trios of particles and small clusters of particles. And it becomes a very detailed, nasty, beautiful packing problem to ask how these particles want to pack. So the computer has told us, and it's it, hard, hard to, hard to you know, make a concise um, explanation, but certainly this is what nature wants to do. And uh, also, uh, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to understand what's being covered here. So can we just go back a slide? And then... Sure. These are the most likely positions for contacts between two particles in our system, mm -hmm. as shown in a heat map. So okay. more likely, uh, less likely. OK, I see. Did that work out? Yeah, and then the center is where that. Uh... Yeah, I'm just showing you one, one unit cell, if uh, you will, one period of the lattice. Thank you for asking, Karch. So that was about position. Let me tell you about dynamics. Where are the forces the strongest? The forces are the strongest, but not top 95 percentile of forces also lie upon these contours. And the more and more dense you make the pin lattice, the more interesting these contours become as the more um, constrained the particles are at fitting between the pins. On the other hand, Let's talk about weak forces, because when you talk about granular packings, it's like they're two stories, the story of the strong, the story of the weak bonds. The weak bonds all want to be near the pin. Totally different story. So why is that going on? Right, so th this slide, sorry, is just a little interruption in thought, but it's I think it's important to say those pictures, can we boil down the information a little bit? Can we back off? Yes, we can talk about the likelihood that the bond, if you will, between two particle centers takes on a certain val angular value theta referred to an axis in this crystal. And one certainly sees the symmetry of the lattice assert itself over here as the pins become sufficiently dense. Uh, six fold symmetry, 
well, three if you only consider half of angle space for the triangular lattice, fourfold symmetry for the square lattice. And then if you boil it down even further and say, give me one number to tell me about angular ordering of these bonds, say here's the bond order parameter, it undergoes an order disorder transition. And the position of this order disorder transition agrees super well with where you see the jamming threshold start to diverge from a square line. It's again where local structure asserts itself, where the particle size is commensurate with the separation between pins. So this is true for the square lattice. It's true for the triangular lattice, but packing is a slippery, difficult problem. There's actually a sweet separation of particles in the triangular lattice where you get a great deal of angular order. And then if you put the particles even closer, the, sorry, the pins even closer together, you frustrate the order. And so the angular order parameter drops again. So there is this theme of frustration that comes in, geometrical frustration that comes in. Um, a case I wanted to tell you about bond strengths. A few seconds and this is gonna go off. Okay, so I'm gonna cancel that and give myself five more minutes. Thank you so much to do that. Um, do the pins make bonds stronger or weaker? Both. <laughs> so when we look at the distribution of forces in this force net where the blue curve is the pin-free situation, what is big F? It's the force normalized to the average force because experience in granular packings have taught people over the last 20 years that there's one force, the average force. And the distribution clusters around the average force and they're not really long tails until you add pins and then there are these marvelous long force tails that develop and we've actually found that these marvelous long force tails for sufficiently dense pins satisfyingly obey a power law we have these power law tails we don't know how to theoretically model them um, as the great Susan Coppersmith, the great Tom Witten and others um, a long time ago um, in their Q model calculation asserted for almost all contact distributions, forces should decay exponentially. This is seen over and over. This decay should be exponential, maybe a Gaussian depending on how you take your average, but these long tails are very new and really beg understanding. And here you see just a snapshot of these exceptionally strong forces. Newton's third law being what it is. It's not just a strong force between a particle and a pin. It's between the particle and then the next particle and the next particle until this force chain finally dies. Sometimes it dies in another pin, sometimes. In fact, this one dies in another pin. So we have a force chain that extends locally between two pins. Um, I'll just go back a slide and say, there's also a story in these weak forces. Why do we have these exceptionally weak forces? What's going on? And they're going on very near the pins. Well, they're actually between particles and between a particle and a pin where I've got two pictures. They come from two places. One is from pins supporting so-called bucklers. So Charbonneau et al. talked about this geometry and the critical exponent associated with these very weak forces it has to do with the kind of localized excitation you get if you try to jiggle this particle that was only supported by the minimum number of supports in the system. Well, we've got a pin, it needs to supply just a diminutive force to keep these almost collinear bonds from buckling up or down. And so these are very weak forces. This is known about, and it's kind of delightful that the pins join in and they even have the same critical exponent till you get to very large pin densities and then the critical exponent starts to change. And then pins do something new. We needed a new word for it. We're call it with, with apologies to the recovery community, we call them enablers because these pins act to enable weak, weak particle forces. This pin is contacting two particles, which really don't need to also be in contact with each other because the pin is supplying the stress needed. So we get extra weak forces between particles from this source as well. And together they contribute to a very different force distribution for our lattice. The very last part of this story I'd love to tell y'all um, has to, and then I'll ask how much time we have left and I'll toggle the last bit accordingly, um, has to do with an analysis based on 
characterizing the topology of the bond network. Um, so our wonderful colleague at Haverford, Ted Brzezinski, is an expert in this and other areas of granular physics. And he has been helping us understand that what we should be doing is doing a high pass filtering of our bonds according to their forces, and then looking at the topological structures that are left. And in two dimensions, there are really only two things to worry about. Are there connected components and are there any loops? So I've got this um, great toy model that student Andy created for us that I, it's supposed to be a movie. I think I have to do this in order to run my movie. Um, a birth death plot. People make these birth death plots. So let's see if I can run it a little bit. Okay, go stop. All right, so here we have our little toy piece of a lattice. And what's going to happen? There is going to be a new loop born. It's going to be born in a little while. You're gonna see the horizontal line cut the birth axis. Okay, go be born. Done, all right, a new loop is born. That loop is going to die soon. What will happen is this vertical line will cut the death axis. How will it die? It will die because we have high pass filtered out an additional bond. So off it goes, boop, it's dead. All right, now we're about to create a new connected component by killing one of the bond, by one of the bonds being high pass filtered out. Oh, there we go. Now we have new a new connected component. There used to be one, now there's two. That will die as well. Bye. And then eventually everything dies. So people play this game when they analyze networks in all kinds of fields of science and engineering. And people have been playing this game in granular materials for about the last eight years. And so we have been playing this game too. For no pins, for pins, for lots of pins, trying to understand what are the, why, why play this game? What are the enduring structures? What structures endure this pruning? And how does that analysis reveal what is unique about pinning the lattice? So people have done this, say, for different densities, Cromer et al, looking at polydispersed disks at densities that become higher and higher. Maybe you cap your system to make it denser. Maybe you just prepare your system more densely, showing how the number of connected components varies as a function of the pruning force. And we find some very unusual results that are not like those that one sees in granular packings. In particular, for a lot of pins, we see the connected components grow more quickly as you prune, but then they hang around much longer than they would in other systems. This very dense red curve, you'll notice that all the curves nest within each other, but we don't get nesting. Also, this is the um, B2, B1 is the number of holes in the system. And that tells a very interesting story. There are the holes, there are fewer holes at the beginning, the more pins we have, but then there are more holes at the end, which are stabilized by the pins. So as we try and make sense of what is really a difficult problem, look at this network. What is the character of the network? Having these topological invariants is actually a, a, a really good characterization tool. And so you mean by, what do you mean by holes? Do you mean like a loop? Number of holes? A Sorry. loop. And a loop that is not a triangle because in an ordered solid, as we all know, that would not be a defect to have a loop. We have a triangle would be just pro forma. But when you create a defect, you create a loop of size four or higher. So in a granular matter community, three does not count as a loop. Uh, four vertices or more counts as a loop. Yes, thank you for asking that. All right, so here's just a logarithmic plot which shows that we do square and triangular lattice and see these very, very, very different topological structure as we add pins and particularly the loopiness, the loops die more quickly, but then they last much longer and there doesn't seem to be any difference. There's a question. Oh yes, question, Wanda. Do you use a software package for topological data analysis? Yes, we use Ripster. Um, Rip, Ripster is one of our principal. Yes, we create the adjacency matrix. Well, we create the bond network ourselves with our C++ program that creates a flat data file. And then we create the, uh, we, we kind of have the data for the weighted adjacency matrix and we use Ripster to do the topological analysis. Yes, thank you for asking that. All right. How many minutes do I have to tell a different story? Um, maybe 10. 10, or 10 is plenty. Thank you. So I'll take a breath, <laughs> have a Zen moment. <clears throat>
So in the last 10 minutes, I would like to um, honor the students who've done work on this very different project, which is the bi-directional flow of active matter. It's something that started many years ago, and it is uh, and And um, you can see that we built a simulation using this incredible environment, Easy Java Simulations. It's now called Easy Java Script Simulations. It was accessible to fresh people. I got HHMI funding to actually work with students who've never coded before and were new to the college and were people from underrepresented groups. And in five weeks of summer, they each did a fully functioning simulation of something that interested them and took legitimate data with it using this platform. So that's my commercial for EJS. Um, and we built this multi-purpose simulator that could do gravity, particles under gravity. Oh no, let's do pedestrians. Okay, let's make the particles monodisperse. No, let's make them polydisperse. Let's put a blockade in the system. So later on, as I run this, you could see a big a big blockade in front of exits. Let's cite the exit or not. If we can't cite the exit, it's rather like pedestrians in a smoky room who are panicking because they can't see where the egress is. So there's this wonderful simulation that I won't run because I don't have time, uh, but I'm delighted to run it after for anyone who's interested. And these are our current two students, Abby and Eamon, who have been working with this simulation to, to do something of scientific interest that we hope to publish. So where have we located our interest using easy Java simulations? We've been thinking about clogging in interfaces or apertures. It's something that's relevant to inert matter. Tau and Behringer looked at photoelastic disks th flowing through an egress. And if you watch the movie, you'd see that these brightly colored ones are gonna form a clog soon. My colleague, Brian Utter, looked at a fluid and then denser disks and less dense disks, sorry, spheres, you let them go. They create a clog in the middle. Um, there have been experiments on pedestrians. As I said, we've had the simulation around and we've simulated bi-directional flow of particles going, competing for this exit. And one hallmark is to see these oscillations in the rate at which particles go through. As one species goes through and then a back pressure builds up from the other species and then the other species barrels through and then the first one of back pressure builds up. So this is very characteristic of this kind of matter. One thing that is not true of inert matter has not been well studied and seemed to be of interest had to do with following behavior. So this is more about physics of life than inert matter. But what happens if there is confusion and there is panic and the particles decide they don't quite know where the exit is, but they do know where their near neighbors are. It turns out that deciding to follow your neighbors is a good strategy to a point, but if you slavishly follow your neighbors and never strike out on your own, it's actually quite a poor strategy in terms of how many people manage to escape or escape and pass through a doorway. So this has been studied for the last 20 years. There's a recent paper by Zhang et al. in Physica um, that looks at panic as well. And that's what we decided to do. We decided to ask the question, I said, okay, I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do um, cancel. I'm gonna give myself um, five minutes. Would that be all right? Five minutes? Sure. Okay, five minutes. So you give myself five minutes to try and um, finish telling the story. Our research question is how does a tendency to follow parameterize, sorry, too, too few Greek letters, too many physicists. Our parameter is called alpha. How does a tendency to follow affect transport of bi-directed active matter through an aperture toward a goal? Sorry, that's a very long, long, long appellation for the research question, but it describes what we were trying to do. When you have your active matter, you have your active sheep, they want to go somewhere. What if their goal is toggles between knowing where each individual sheep wants to go and just going the way that the sheep around you are going. So is this, a, is this a compatible or an incompatible load? I'm trying to get through a doorway. That's the question. So, so why is this called bidirectional? Oh, because uh, some, some sheep are going up and some are going down. These sheep, these sheep are not, but, but these particles are. Some want to go south, some want to go north. Thank okay. you for yes. asking that question. So that's like the sheep thinking, the, some sheep think the exit is south and something it's not. Precisely. So we can think the um, charged colloids can be made to do this. Janus particles can be made to do this. Um, and um, 
wow, with living creature, it's dangerous to do these experiments with people, but a few people have gotten the IRBs to agree to let them do it with human beings. Your students, some are coming into lecture, some are leaving your lecture. The, you know, there we go. So there's a reason to want to go one way and want to go another way through a doorway. Thank you for asking that. Okay, so the boring method slide is that we use this beautiful EJS environment. This was, we started before Python was popular. Um, and we use this force model. There's an awful lot of stuff here, but I would just ask people to look at this and say, oh, she does granular material forces. There is, there is kinetic friction. There is, uh, there is a, a spring repulsive force. There is also the desire force to go in the desired direction, which is I want to head to the nearest point in the doorway. Once I'm through, I want to head to the far wall. There's also the psychosocial force, which says I would rather not brush against another entity, please. And then there is noise, which turns out to have a very important role when you talk about phases of active matter. There, there are temporal noise-driven phase transitions. They can stabilize, noise can actually stabilize some phases. I have a Chepasenko paper that shows this. Okay, and where is this following? It's living here in the desire force. Do you want to go toward the doorway where if you know where it is? Well, you don't, you know where it is in the simulation that results I'm gonna show. Or do you want to follow your friends, please? And there's some relaxation time. Oh yeah, um, I was wondering, is something like Earth walking described by this, or yes. is that entirely different? Okay. It's not entirely different. That's a wonderful observation. And, and the very first kind of simulation called Boyd's, you know, which was in the 80s, tried to model bird flocking, and there were only three things. Um, I want to direct my velocity toward the rest of the flock. I want my center to be kind of where the center of the flock is, and I don't want to brush my wing against another bird. And then in and of itself, there's a wonderful job of um, simulating what birds do. You even have, don't need a leader to land or take off. It's pretty crazy. But yes, that the, should talk after, but there are a few differences as well. So there are a bunch of variants on these wonderful social force models. Thank you for asking. Um, okay, yeah. So uh, let me tell you about the rate of transport in the last couple of minutes we have together. Um, so how about getting through the doorway? How many particles in a given time? The, I picked a plot that showed the cyan particles being followers, the magenta particles being non-followers. In this geometry, being a follower is a poor idea if the, if the goal is to have a good rate of transport. And as a function of alpha, that's how the curve looks. So the more and more following, the lower and lower one's rate of transport. And the less following, Wow, you get through more easily. You're not doing anything different, but the opposing team is busy trying to follow other members of its team. So this is a purely collective phenomenon that the magenta particles are able to travel. We have collective, cooperative, competitive phenomenon that the magenta particles get through more easily. What happens if you add quench disorder in the form of these obstacles, which we place down in a Poisson disk manner? So no particles are actually closer than a radius A. We really didn't want to get localized clogs of our active matter, which is what would happen if we place the obstacles completely at random. Well, with obstacles, these mitigate the effect of following on transport and they mitigate it for both species. So you can see there is less transport for the non-followers and there is actually more transport for the followers. So the obstacles help the followers. It breaks up their flow. Okay, what are the radii like? The Poisson disks have a mean separation of 2.3 particle diameters. The radius over which followers look at each other is four mean diameters. So clearly we have work to do to understand how those two leg scales play with each other. Last idea, is there clogging? Oh my gosh, that's the big question. Uh, I gotta show you the movie. Well, is there clogging? This talk is all about jamming and clogging. What am I going to tell you? Is there going to be clog? Well, how do we know? We could watch forever and maybe a few particles start to get through after forever. Maybe they don't. So there's this really wonderful idea, which is to look at the statistics of lag times. And here is from Zurigel, actual sheep in Spain, watching them. This is a time series of sheep. And here is a lag between bursts of sheep. 
There's a small, is that a lag between bursts of sheep? Maybe, or maybe you just consider that a natural breathing space between this sheep and the other sheep. But we can look at our particles in the transit region and we can turn it into a telegraph process and say, okay, particles are getting through, no, lag. Particles are getting through, no, I should have used this cursor to begin with, lag. Okay, particles are getting through. And we can look at the statistical distribution of these lags. If that statistical distribution has a long enough tail, you can argue that there will be a clog, that is the mean lag time goes to infinity. It's a very simple, lovely argument. If you're able to draw either the probability distribution or the cumulative distribution function, complementary cumulative, and find that indeed you can parameterize the long time tails. So it's very heartening to me to know that in PhysRev, they published a paper called Flow and Clogging of a Sheep Herd. Um, and this is the argument made in that paper um, that if there are long time tails with a critical exponent, with, uh, with an exponent, sorry, which is less than two, then the mean clog time diverges, then you get a sheep clog. So can we do that? Sure, we can do that. You have to be very careful. It's so easy to say, I have a power law. So we were careful. We followed the wonderful advice of these three Carnegie Mellon professors to fit probability distribution tails to power laws. And we used a Python power law package that springs off from their theory. And we were very heartened to see that indeed we could interpret the long time distribution of lags of our particles as power laws. It was a good model. Is there a clog? Yes. Following does create a clog. With a certain degree of following, the followers become clogged forever, according to the statistical analysis. And now, any thoughts on what obstacles do? Do they move that? I'll take a vote. If you think that obstacles um, are, a commence, are a compatible load and make it easier to clog, signify by saying I. If you think, okay, one vote, two votes. If you think that they are an, yeah, an incommensurate load and they make it harder to plug, signify by saying I. Thank you. All right. Democracy in progress. It works. They actually make it harder to clog. They move the clogging threshold out. They change the character of these curves too. So obstacles mitigate cooperative effects of following. They move clogging to a higher following factor. Um, all right, that is all the science I have to say. And this is my conclusion. It is, I let David Merman say it for me. Physics talks, it's in their nature. They should be boring and confusing. <laughs> The best reason to lecture is it affords me the opportunity to rediscover why I did it. Most important question, preparing my talk, why on earth anyone might be interested in hearing my talk. So here were the questions that we investigated. You know, We wanted to know about the theoretical and practical consequences of incorporating fixed degrees of freedom into the simplest, best understood model for jamming. We wanted to know in the last five minutes of the talk how following affected clogging. And we wanted to know whether quench disorder is a compatible or incompatible load. And I believe we discovered that it is an incompatible load. It makes clogging less likely. Um, so uh, I don't think I finished early and I do apologize, but let's all remember this. The best way to make an audience happy is not to put a summary, but to finish early. Um, but I will say thank you to our funding sources who've been extremely generous, the National Science Foundation, earlier the PRF offices of Swarthmore College. Um, I'd like to thank you all, um, Professor Harsh Madhur and Shulei Jang for having me here at UPenn. Thank you for being so patient and engaged and listening to me. Um, and finally, I never do this, but I have to do this today. Um, uh, in 1969, Case Western Reserve University was formed by the merger of Case uh, and Western Reserve University. And um, this lady, who was my mother, um, used to teach at night to make extra money at Western Reserve University. She was an educator and she taught education students. She had a master's degree. And she was born 100 years ago today, on November 22nd, 1921. So there we are. Thank you.
So the physics you've been describing, particularly jamming, would be very different and much simpler in 1D. <laughs> I'm curious in 3D if you expect any new physics and what's happening in that area. It would be del well, first of all, this thank you for asking that question. It's a very rich, wonderful question. It turns out that the lower critical dimension for jamming with this type of model is 2D. So when you go up to higher dimensions, you expect critical exponents to be preserved. And in fact, there is, two dimensions is marginal, so they're a little bit finicky in two dimensions. But much of what we do, we would expect to translate. Now, in practical terms, good luck levitating pins in three dimensions. And we thought about this. What would be of interest to, you know, kind of the, the practical, um, you know, the engineering community, technologists, maybe inserting rods and having them be, you know, them, them be the kind of fixed fixed degrees of freedom that one is using in 2D. I, I'd love to know about, maybe there is some optical application where you can use, you know, kind of cre create spots with lasers in three dimensions and understand some kind of optical plasma and pins would actually be related. But it's it's difficult for me to understand the application. But absolutely, one could do the simulation. In, in yeah, I was going to say the experiments might be hard, but the Simulations yeah. are not. Indeed. So this is something that we could approach with the C++ code if we had time, and we should approach with the LAX code. Yes. Chuck, I have a question. Chuck? Yeah, OK, remotely. Um, this is maybe a naive I'm question. Muted, Chuck. We can't hear you. Unmuted. Oh, hold on a second. Uh, I am unmuted. Can you hear me? No, we can't hear you. Oh, we don't. It is unmuted. Oh, it's because the sound is off here. Oh, uh, sorry. Do I? Yeah. Okay. Let, let me let me try typing the question. Oh, no, we can hear you now. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Yeah. So this is kind of a naive question, but a very general question. Uh, jamming and percolation um, seem like they should be related. Can you say anything about that? I would. I would like to, but the the um I I my expertise doesn't let me speak with authority about it. I know that initially people thought that a type of percolation called K-core was highly relevant. And there's a paper by New and Schwartz about it. There's a resurgence of interest in that. And there's a 2018 paper about how the jamming point is the um, relates to the emergence of a giant K-core cluster. Um, so K-core is percolation where you say particles are only allowed to live if they have a certain number of bonds associated with them. So K refers to the number of bonds. And um, that that feels like there's also rigidity percolation, but I don't think people have tried to push on that analogy. So K-core percolation is is the closest that I would I would say there is active work on. Thank you. The chat has 11 things, but they're probably old. Uh, yeah. Um, should there be anything relevant in the chat? Or? No. Okay. no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have one quick question. That maybe I didn't get some questions, but we should probably wrap up after this one and break to informal discussions. Okay, well, uh, I was wondering if you looked at uh, random uh, pinning as opposed to in, on a lattice. And... Um, well, yes. So um, so in our um, in, in one of the um, early slides when I showed the threshold um, and, and also some of the data slides. We have our, um, we have our, random, um, our random configurations of pins. The problem with the random configuration of pins is that it really does start to become very um, configuration dependent. And we made the decision that we would not fix the pins um, and have them um, I occupy exactly the same positions as we as we explored configuration space for the particles. And um, so we got a lot of noise. And also, once you go beyond a certain pin density, you really start to um, nucleate finite clusters. And it felt like it was an inauthentic um, sort of model or a different sort of model. We weren't really asking what lattice facilitates jamming. We were asking questions about finite clusters. Uh, we should have used the Poisson dis disk distribution, which doesn't let pins. It is random save. There is a constraint that pins cannot be any closer than a certain chosen distance. And so we would not, um, we would not create these small clustering clogs. Um, 
So in another lifetime, we would do exactly what you say. We would use Poisson disk distribution. And we learned from our mistake, and, and that's the distribution we used later when we did the work on the um, active model. Yeah. Mistake, whatever. We learned. All right. With the light of the time, I think we'll leave it here and see if it's for uh, you know, further discussions. So thanks very much. Here's your talk.